All right, hi, let's start. So today, tutorial six, we're going to talk about a concept called transfer learning and domain adaptation. Two related concepts, actually. Um, specifically, we'll uh, talk about the context of transfer learning, define it, and then we'll show two, two different examples of, um, of this concept. So one is... Uh, how to use pre-trained models and for other tasks, and one and the other concept is uh, domain adaptation. Okay. So let's just remind ourselves briefly about the context that we were working with so far, at least until the last lecture about unsupervised learning. So, so far we, we at least in the tutorials, all the examples that, that we talked about we're, uh, we're using this uh, supervised context, which, um, as you recall, means that you have labeled samples, basically. It has, you have a data set, each sample x that belongs to some uh, feature space, squiggly x. <coughs> each sample is um, a d-dimensional uh, vector, and uh, it has a, a label, which is uh, y, which belongs to some label space. Okay, and we, we looked at various kinds of examples in this context. Usually we, were, we looked at classification. Um, so in that, in that context we have, uh, for example, C classes. And kind of implicitly we, we assume that, that there's, there's some kind of joint distribution between the labels and the samples. Between the samples and the labels. So, so we also implicitly assume that there's some kind of uh, distribution over the actual samples only. And we want to learn this conditional from the data. That's what we, we were talking about so far, mostly. Okay, the, the, the thing is about this setting is that it, is, it assumes that, at least traditionally, that the training and test sets come from the same data distribution. So we, we didn't really talk about this because what we, what we did so far, mostly, was just take a, a data set. And we had one data set and one, one task, for example, one classification task. And we said, OK, let's split our data into training and test, or training and validation and test. And if we, if we split it the right way, for example, we stratify the classes, then, then we can say everything belongs to the same distribution. But what happens if this, not, if this is not the case? Okay. Might not always be the case. So, for example, in, in, in many applications in the real world, we, we want to, at, at inference time, work with data that is either not available to us right now or, or it's not labeled. And in any case, it, it's, it, it might come from a completely different distribution. So this is one example. Let's say we, we, we want to recognize digits and we, we train on MNIST, but when we actually... When we actually uh, the, the actual application that we're trying to, to solve is um, detecting numbers on street signs. So it's kind of related. I mean, if it, for a human, it's, it's only marginally more difficult if you look at a street sign than to look at the MNIST. I mean, it's, it's almost the same difficulty to detect the numbers here for you. But, but when we train our model, so, so much information about this data distribution is implicitly encoded into, into its parameters that were learned that... In practice, that's just because we, we train the model that works well on MNIST does not mean it will work well on any other kind of distribution of data. Okay, so that's kind of a motivating example. So let's just do quickly a bunch of definitions to understand kind of the, the problem in this context. So first, uh, we have a feature space. We'll denote it with this squiggly x. Okay, so this is just the, the space of all possible samples. For example, if, we, if we're working with uh, 32 by 32 color images um, with uh, 256 intensity levels, then it's, uh, even though it sounds limited, it's a pretty large feature space, as we, we can see here. So this is just the space that we're working in. And usually we have a, a training set, which is a, some, some samples from that space, which is obviously a very, very small subset. Okay, so, for example, the, the images in the, this example of CIFAR 10, even though it's a large data set and, and you, can, you can imagine there are many more images that are not in this data set that belong to the same categories, it's still a very, very small subset of the whole 
feature space of 32 by 32 color images, which is much, much larger. It doesn't contain only natural images, for example. Okay, so we have a training set. Feature set. <coughs> we assume that, again, there exists some, some probability distribution that we don't know over our training set. We don't really care about the distribution over the, the whole feature set, but we care about what, what, what's relevant for our problem. So, so in, in, in C410, this would be the distribution of natural images, for example. Okay, so if you have a, a non-natural image, like maybe a noise image or just a black image, then we, we, would, we would want this uh, distribution to show it has a low probability. And um, it also should reflect class, class balances, even though this, this distribution is not the conditional, so it's not related to the classes. Um, this is just, just, uh, just as an example. You can see, for example, if, if we have only two features, then there are, there are regions in the feature space that have very low probability of a sample being there, and there are very dense regions of the feature space. So that's, this is what we mean by a distribution over the, the data set. You can ignore the, the colors for the classes. And, and of course, if, if, if there were like clusters, and one of them would be much larger, then there, there would be a different um, d probability density for that class, implicitly. OK, so uh, next thing we, we have is, of course, a label space, which is uh, the, the space of all possible labels in, in this problem. So usually we have uh, just uh, integers as, uh, as the number of classes. OK? And we, in the supervised context, we have, uh, we have this y, which is the, the set of labels for our data. OK? And again, we want to learn some function from, from x to, to a prediction for y. Or probabilistically, we want to learn this conditional from the data. OK? So, so far, this is a kind of a recap. But now, just to formalize what, what, what the transfer learning context is, so we will define a domain as a set of uh, feature space and a probability distribution over some data set. Okay, so note that this is x and this is squiggly x. And we will define a task as the, the label space and the conditional probability that we want to learn. Okay? So what, what's transfer learning? Given a source domain and a source learning task, ds and ts, and a target domain, dt and target task, T, okay, T target, T, T. Um, we, w in the context of transfer learning, we're dealing with cases where either the source domain is different or the, the task is different. And sometimes it might be even a little bit of both. Okay? So th there, could be, there could be even more constraints that, I, that might be captured here. For example, if there are no, little or no labels available in the target domain. So it, it also, say, it also means that the task is different because, because of the way we define the task, which is the, the labels, includes the label space. Okay. So this is kind of a ge generalization of the supervised context that we, we were reminded of in the beginning. Because in the supervised context, it just means that our source and target domains are the same, and the source and target tasks are the same. Okay, so again, we, we assume that we we're working with, we, we will at inference time, see data from the same uh, distribution, and we will work with the same labels that we trained on. Okay? But, as you can see, you can, you can guess that there are, there are at least two cases for each of them being different. So let's kind of go over them. And so uh, the, first, the first, uh, first example is if we have uh, different tasks but on the same domain. So Recall that a learning task was defined like that. So again, there are two cases. Either the labels are different or the conditional is different. And it's, it's not mutually exclusive. It can be actually both, which is, which is in this context it usually is. So just a quick example to understand the context. We might, we might, uh, we might have um, labels or we might train on a, on, a sm on a small label space, for example, C410. But we, we want to actually do, do the inference on a much, much larger label space. 
So in this case, we can we can arguably say that the the domains are are um, identical, at least very very similar, but we have much more classes. And um, conversely, the other case is if the target conditional is different, which is which is to say that these conditional distributions from for the source domain and target domain are different. So it, it might happen when, for example, the classes are very very differently balanced when we train and when we eventually um, run our model for inference. Okay, so this, this might be that case. And uh, the more interesting cases which we will focus on are when we have uh, the, same, the same task but, but data comes from different domains. Okay, so again, a, a domain was defined like that, feature space and a, pro a, condition and a probability over the data that we have. So again, we have these two cases. Either the feature spaces are different. For example, we, we have a source domain of grayscale images, and uh, our target is color images, so we want to generalize to color images. Or uh, another, another uh, more, maybe more intuitive example, if we, if we um, represent documents in a space where uh, we have a bag of words kind of representation, so each document is represented by a vector which just says whether a word is present in the document. So it, it would be a different feature space if we had different languages. Okay. So that's one option. And the other option is that we have different da data distributions. Okay. So again, a common example that we see is source domain contains hand-drawn images or maybe simulated, simulated images of th things like that, while the target domain has actual photographs. And in the, in the example for, for languages, so maybe we're talking about documents with the, sa with the same language, so then we have the same feature space of words, but the, the languages, the, the documents have different topics in the source and target domains, so the distribution of words would be very different. Okay, and uh, here's a, a visual example where you have um, a dri dri images of uh, driving probably for a segmentation uh, task. And when you, when you train, for example, you, you only saw images or you only have labeled data in a kind of a day scenario while well, you actually do care about all these other scenarios, for example, night or, or um, different var various lighting conditions or maybe different weather conditions that can affect the images vastly in terms of the distribution. So this is the same, same feature space but completely different data distributions. Okay, so th this, this is a very common kind of problem that uh, people try to tackle today, and uh, it's called the domain adaptation usually. So we'll see an example of that. And uh, just more generally, based on these definitions, there are kind of many, many different kind of uh, su sub-tasks and sub-designations for these tasks. So like I said, we will see uh, two different examples of this transfer learning uh, kind of context now. All right, so let's start the actual actual example. So the first example, which is a, ba a very basic one, but also very useful, so that's why I'm, I'm showing it, is uh, using a pre-trained model to, to do some other tasks by either fine-tuning or modifying. Okay, so, so like I said, this is very common, very useful. Imagine that we have trained some kind of model on a source domain, and now we, we, we already learned this model, Presumably, it encodes some kind of knowledge about that source domain, but we want to want to leverage this model for, for a different task. Okay, for example, we we in in our target domain we have much less labeled data, and and we think it might be infeasible to train a very large, very deep model from scratch with so with um, so little labeled samples. Okay, so so here is an example. Um, for example, so as an example, let's uh, imagine that we trained a very deep uh, convnet on ImageNet. So we had one million, at least a million, labeled uh, images with a uh, thousand different classes. So it's a very large problem. It takes a long time to train. But but our problem is actually we're talking about medical images, for example. So we have very very few images with very, with not a lot of labels. And we want to kind of leverage it. We want to 
gain some of that knowledge that we, we gain, use some of the knowledge that we gain on ImageNet in our task. Okay, by, by maybe, perhaps by learning something new and, you, and reusing most of the model. Okay, so first question is why 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 do you, why would why would we think it would work? So we talked about this when we talked about convolutional networks. Any ideas? Why would this work? Okay, common building blocks. Okay, so. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's right. So we, we think it will work because at least for for vision it would work because um, it has been it has been uh, shown in in various papers, but this is a really cool one that that there there are actually hierarchical features that are captured by by convolution networks, and as you go deeper in the network, you capture more more higher level and more class specific or task specific features. So, for example, in ContNets, when you look at lower layers, so by the way, th this uh, this shows a visualization of uh, convolutional filters that were learned uh, using a model that's similar to to AlexNet, which is uh, not not very deep. I think five layers, and um, so one of the first successful models. So it shows it shows uh, a visualization of uh, the learned filters, and next to each filter, the corresponding image is uh, an image from the training data that had maximal activation, or one of the maximally activated um, patches for that filter. So you can see what the filters are actually firing on. Okay, so, so for example, really in the, in the first layer, you, you really see kind of patterns of, uh, of edges, different directions, and things like that. And next you can see various different textures. And next you can see geometric shapes. So the deeper you go, you get more high-level features. But if you go very deep, then you, you actually start getting really task-specific filters. So, for example, this was trained on ImageNet. And in ImageNet, we have a lot of dogs or other, and other animals or, or flowers and things like that. So you, you really get filters that, can, uh, that are maximally activated by, by a face of a dog, things like that. So intuitively, maybe if we, if we had a medical application, then we would want to perhaps not so much use these layers, but the first layers, which, which are maximally activated by contours, edges, ge patterns, textures, and uh, kind of geometric shapes, we might, might be actually able to reuse them. OK, so based on that, we, we, we we can start from a pre-trained model, like, like that one. And then we could perhaps fine-tune the convolutional filters, which mainly in the deeper layer. So, so like I said, the deeper we go, the, the more class or task specific we get. So if we have a completely different task, we might want to ignore that. If, if our task might be similar, we might choose to maybe fine-tune them less, the deeper layers. So, so it's kind of a matter of what, what, what task we're transferring into. And further, we, we might want to change the classifier part. After all the convolutional features have been, have been calculated, there's a, usually a classifier part. So we might want to change it so it, uh, it, it combines the features into our, our different classes. Or we might want to remove it completely and just use the, the network as a feature extractor. Maybe we have some other kind of task. For example, we want to take the convolutional features and put them into an RNN and try to create a sequence of uh, words, for example, based on that image. Okay, so we might not even need the classification part. But still, the, the convolutional filters, if we fine-tune them a bit, might be relevant for many other tasks. Okay, so let's, let's uh, show an example with some code. So I'm not really going to train anything here. I'm just going to show you a few kind of steps along the way and kind of nuances to, to note when you're doing this. Because again, this is a very useful uh, thing to do. Might be useful in, in, your, in your homeworks or in the course project to kind of work with pre-trained models and see what you can uh, do based on them. So I'm, I'm going to use uh, the model zoo that, that's a part of uh, TorchVision. I'm uh, loading here a ResNet 18, so it's, uh, it's not a very deep model, actually. 
if you if you take the really deep ones, it takes a lot of time to download all the parameters. So I'm, I'm just uh, loading this, and it gives me a model based on the ResNet paper, 18 layers, and it downloads the weights for me and initializes all the weight tensors to, to, to have the values that they had after they trained this model on ImageNet. Okay, so just quickly looking at the model, we can see its structure, and it's uh, exactly really the same. We saw this in one of the tutorials where we implemented it ourselves. The, we have uh, some kind of initial conv part, and then we have these uh, repeating blocks of, um, of basic blocks that have a skip connection, and then another basic block, and then they uh, in increase the number of filters and as the layers uh, progress. So we have kind of different layers, and each layer has uh, two, two blocks. And at the end, after layer four, there's a pooling and an FC, a fully connected part. So this fully collected, connected part expects 512 features. So this is just because of the size of the images in ImageNet. And it outputs a thousand, a thousand different uh, scores because ImageNet has a thousand classes. Okay, so we can see this model really was, really uh, is, is uh, fit for ImageNet. So we have, let's say we have a completely different task, so we need to kind of adapt it a bit. So the first thing we want to do is, fr is, is freeze it because we, like I said, we want to fine tune some of the layers, okay? So we, we need to apply some, some logic or maybe trial and error and decide what we exactly want to train in the model. But starting with this, first thing we can do is just say all, all the parameters in the model do not require gradients. This means that if we, if we try to train this model, nothing will happen. No, no weights will be updated. Okay, and now let's imagine that we decide for some reason that layer 4 of ImageNet contains two high-level features for our task. We have a completely different task. So we want to retrain those layers, but keep the, the lower layers, because we, we decided that lower is are relevant for us as is. So we can kind of unfreeze or, or thaw this layer, just say that. And equivalently, or at least equivalently in, in terms of training, another way to do it is use a, a feature of, of the optimizers where you can uh, give sets of parameters and just say that, for example, in, in these layers we want a zero learning rate. Okay, and in layer four, for example, we want a very small learning rate because we want to just fine tune it a bit. And, but for the rest of the model, or from, for our FC layer, we want to start with a higher layer learning rate, for example. So this is just an example. I don't know if, it, I don't know if this is any good, but it's kind of a, something that you need to keep in mind for fine tuning. Okay, so just um, maybe you can, you can try to guess, like, why, why, is, why, why is this perhaps preferable to freeze it like that and not like that? Because, yeah, exactly, because, um, because when you do the forward pass, then all the tensors that require gradients have to track all the operations that happened on them. So they build a computational graph and it takes, it takes more time to do it. If you just say you don't require gradients, then your forward passes will be faster, your model will train much faster. So this, is, this might be a better way to do it like that. Not sure if there's a, any cases where this is better. Need to think about that. Okay. Uh, next part, uh, we need to replace the last last part of the network. So we had a fully connected layer there. So let's say that we want to keep it. Like I said, we can we can decide to remove it completely. Maybe we can embed the first layers into a different uh, a different model that we create. So we can just create a new module and just put this pre-trained uh, module there and run the forward pass until the point where we want. But let's say that we want to just replace the fully connected layer. Remember, it had a thousand output classes. So instead of that, let's put this kind of combination of the number of CNN features that were created. So we can just take it from the existing, existing layer. So we want to create a fully connected layer from that to some hidden, hidden dimension that I just, uh, I just put here right now. And uh, then we want to convert that to, for example, the number of classes in our task. So we replace this layer, and this layer will have to be trained from scratch. Okay, so this is the, the last layer that, we, that we, we really initialize randomly, and it will train from scratch, while the rest of our model, the convolutional features, won't be trained from scratch, or maybe won't be trained at all, depending how you define it. Okay, so 
Now onto the data itself. So I just uh, I'm I lo I'm loading here CIFAR just as an example of a different um, a different do uh, do target domain, but it's not really important. Uh, uh, what is important here is this uh, first nuance that when you use pre-trained model, you have to actually um, check how they were trained. So for example, if this model was trained on ImageNet, then it it does expect images of a certain size, and when it was trained it normalized the, the data in a certain way. So remember that you usually compute some kind of normalization on your training data and then apply that normalization all the time. Even when you do inference, you use the same normalization. Okay. So if I'm using it here as a feature extractor, then I need to make sure that I'm inputting data with the same normalization that, was trained, that it was trained with. Okay, so I got this, um, I got this from the documentation of the model that I pre-trained. Okay, so after, uh, after we have this modified version of the model, we can just uh, do a quick sanity check. So I, I passed the CIFAR10 image here. So remember, CIFAR10 is a different size, so it shouldn't, shouldn't work. And, and it originally, it had 1,000 output classes, so we can see it, it does forward pass, and we do get 10 output classes. So hopefully, we modified this model correctly, and now we can train it. Um, another thing that might be helpful um, is uh, or oh, before that, there's another nuance here. That since since uh, we 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 said that we don't require gradients for all the parameters, then we need to we need to we need to uh, make sure not to pass them into the the optimizer here. Okay, so the second nuance here is just to to go over the model and uh, only take parameters that that require grad, the ones that are left after we froze what we wanted to freeze. Okay, we can pass that to our optimizer, and then we, we have the actual optimizer that we're working with. Or we can do the second approach that defines specific groups of parameters and different parameters for each group. Okay, another very useful, um, another very useful trick that's commonly used in, in this context of um, using pre-trained models is, is performing scheduling of the learning rate. So here I'm using something also built in. Um, scheduling of the learning rate means that we, we don't use we don't use just a, a fixed learning rate, or, and we don't even use a, an optimizer that kind of changes the learning rate. But we, 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 we apply some sort of schedule. For example, after each epoch, we multiply the learning rate by 0.9, by 0 0.9, or something like that. So we decay it. And in this case, for example, I just used a, a scheduler that, that uh, can reduce it on, uh, on plateau. So what, what this means is that when you use the scheduler here during your training, you'll do something like should have wrote it. You do something like step, and you give it your loss. Okay, and it it basically checks whether the loss was de has decreased over the, the the last few epochs. If if it hasn't decreased after some number of epochs, then it will multiply your learning rate by some factor. Okay, so you you initialize it with the optimizer so that it can modify the learning rate inside the optimizer. Okay, so then you just train using what's relevant for your tasks. I'm not going to show any training example here. Any questions about that, fine-tuning? Okay, so let's see a more interesting example now. Okay, so let's talk about a uh, different transfer learning context, the context of uh, domain adaptation. Like I said, it was one of the different settings for transfer learning. Specifically, we'll look at an unsupervised case. So let, let's consider this problem. We have a, a source domain of MNIST, which is the handwritten digits that we keep running into. And um, our target domain is, uh, is a colored and textured version of MNIST. So this is was actually, th these images were actually created from MNIST. They uh, segmented the, the numbers, and then they blended kind of images from a different data set so that the number gets gets one image and the background gets another image, so they have a different texture sometimes and the, the numbers are now not, not the same color and the backgrounds have texture, so it's a much more difficult problem. And uh, moreover, we'll, we'll consider the unsupervised setting where we assume that we do not have any labels for the target domain, okay? So we have all these, all these uh, MNIST M or MNIST colored 
images, but we have no labels, and we have lots of MNIST images with labels, so we want, we want to train a model that can actually detect numbers in this target uh, domain based on only labels from the source domain. So this is a more realistic uh, setting. And again, for, for humans, it's only marginally more difficult. But like I said, because we, we encode so much information about the distribution of the data into our model, it actually turns out, if you, if you try it just naively, that you will get very bad results. Okay? So, somehow we need to force our convolutional network, which we use, again, to extract features from the image, we, we want to learn features of the, of the shapes of the digit, but, but not anything related to the color distribution. Okay, you can imagine that we only care about the shape. When, when, we, when we look at it as people and try to understand what number it is, we really don't care about anything related to the color. We just look at the shape. Okay, so we have to somehow ignore different distributions between domains. So the approach that I'm going to show you is based on a paper from uh, 2015 called Unsupervised Domain Adaptation. And uh, it uses this kind of uh, approach based on something called the uh, domain confusion loss. All right, so the, the idea is, is, is here, the idea here is to use two different heads that are kind of uh, classification heads that are placed above the convolutional feature extractor. So, so the first part is, um, this blue part here, is a, just a, a predictor for the class label. So after you, you input an image of, of, some, of some, some of the digits, of a digit, you forward pass through this uh, green part which extracts convolutional features. Those features, for example, are squashed into a vector that goes through these fully connected layers, and then we have a class score, and then we do cross entropy and whatever, as we saw. So we saw this again and again so far. But now we're adding some, some, something new that we didn't see so far. We're adding a second classification head to the model, which is a domain classifier. So it will take the exact same features and pass it through a different fully connected layer or layers and try to predict the domain. Okay, so if it's MNIST, then we say it, we call it domain zero, for example, and if it's uh, MNIST M, we'll call it domain one. And the, perp the goal of this classifier here is to try to predict what domain the image came from based on the convolutional features, okay, based on the features that were created here. Okay, but, but the thing is that this, this as opposed to the, the label predictor loss, this loss will treat as a confusion loss. So we're trying to actually get our model to be confused about the domain. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to try to maximize this loss, okay, while we minimize this loss. And this paper showed a really, a really simple and cool trick to do it. It's kind of similar to the adversarial concept of, uh, of GANs, but not, not, it's not a GAN. It's a different kind of way to do it. We, we, use, um, we use just a, a, a layer kind of that reverses the gradient for the domain label. After, after, we, after we, com we, we compute the domain label and start to backprop, we just flip the, the sign of the gradient here so that when we, when we apply uh, these gradients to, to our convolutional features, we're basically m trying to maximize that loss. Okay? And also, Take note that when we train with the MNIST data, then we do have labels. So the MNIST data will go all the way through the blue classifier and get a, a class loss, and we'll go to the uh, red classifier and get a domain loss and back for both. But the MNIST M or target, this target data will only, only go to the domain label. Okay, we'll ignore it. So what we're trying to do here is confuse the, confuse the convolutional part of the model so that it so it can't really, it can't create features that allow, allow the domain classifier to work, while it still can, can create features that allow the label predictor to work. Okay, so is the concept clear? All right, so this is the, this is the model based on that paper that I mentioned. Let's uh, start to implement it. All right, so first just uh, loading the data, not going to go over this. You can, uh, if you want to run this notebook, it's, it's, there's a link here that you need to download the data from. Just uh, plot some images from the, from the data sets. See what we're working with. 
it's a bit slow. Not sure why it's so slow. Okay, so as, as promised, our uh, source data is uh, MNIST and our target data is MNIST M. You can see it looks very textured and different colors and stuff like that. Okay, so let's start with the model. Our model here has uh, three parts, just like we, we explained. It has a, a deep CNN. In our case, it won't be deep. It will be very shallow. It will have only uh, two, two convolutional layers. And uh, using the, the normal kind of uh, conv, relu, max pool, I think uh, there is also batch norm. Okay, so just a basic uh, two layer conv net. Then we have this digit classification uh, head, which is uh, three fully connected layers, ending with uh, softmax or log softmax. And uh, the domain classification part is, is similar, but there's this uh, gradient reversal part here. Okay. So recall, the, the point of the gradient reversal layer is to do a no-op in the forward pass, but in the backward pass, it's supposed to flip the sign of the gradient. Okay. So how should we implement it? Remember, if we, if we just do something in the forward pass, like if, if we would uh, multiply by a factor in the forward pass, then it would affect the backward pass. We, we need something that has no effect in the forward pass, but has, has an effect in the backward pass. So it's kind of a different, uh, different requirement than what, what we have so far when we just do operations on tensors and then say, say all the operations are recorded into a graph and then we say backward and then we get automatic differentiation. So it's not the same exactly because we, we need something that kind of uh, hacks, into, ha hacks into the backward pass. And then we want to use the backward. With backward implementing. Yeah, I think that might work, but it's not what I did, so... I'm going to show a different way, but I think yeah you can you can maybe override the backward of a N module. Um, what what you can also do is uh, use um, something from Autograd called function. So this is this is a way to define an operation and really explicitly say that this is an operation that works on tensors, and I want to explicitly define what it does in the forward and what it does in the backward. And this, th these objects are actually how, uh, how all the operations in, in PyTorch are implemented, so that um, when, you do, you, when you do things on tensors, you create a graph of these, these objects. So you have a, a function that points to a previous function and a previous function, and so on. So I'm just creating a really simple one. I just said this is a gradient revo reverse, reversal function. In the forward pass, it does basically nothing, but it stores, it stores uh, my parameter. So this parameter is what I'm going to multiply the gradient by, I will give it in the forward pass, because in the backward pass I can't, I can't, I can't uh, pass any parameters in. And in the backward pass, I just uh, load my uh, saved constant and take the output. So this is like you probably already seen by now in the homework, so this is the output of the, this is the gradient of the output of this function. And I need to compute the gradient of the input. So I just, I just uh, apply this uh, constant to the negated uh, output, as promised, OK? And then I return it. So that's how to implement the gradient reversal. And then the model itself is kind of straightforward. We have our three parts, the feature extractor. So very briefly, I'll just go over it. We have a, a conv layer from uh, three channels to 64. This, these parameters are just taken from the paper. So nothing to really explain here. We very basic, like we saw in the previous tutorials. So two conv nets, two conv layers, sorry, with ReLU, batch norm, and pooling. Then we have this classifier, which we ha here we hard coded the actual number of features based on the input image size. Okay, so we we're just assuming it's uh, it's the MNIST size, which I think is twenty eight by twenty eight. Um, and we have uh, yeah these uh, three three linear fully connected layers and the log softmax at the end, which will give us uh, log probabilities. Then the domain classifier part is uh, two fully connected and log softmax. And uh, in the forward passes where we have to really apply a, a little bit of logic, 
So we'll take our input uh, batch of images, and we have this uh, gradient reversal layer lambda. So here it's a lambda. It's, it's the same uh, parameter that we saw in the, in the figure. So this is just, uh, first of all, to just expand. If we have a single channel, like in MNIST, we have one color channel, so we just, we just uh, expand it by um, multiplying the data in each channel. Then we apply the feature extractor, we get the convolutional features, and we squash them into a vector. We, we do our gradient reversal layer, okay? So what, what this will do is give us, instead of the feature, the tensor, um, the tensor features, it will give us a new tensor that has this operation in its graph, in its computational graph. So the reverse features tensor is just like features in terms of uh, its content, its data, but it has this extra function in its computational graph that will reverse the gradient when we do backward. Okay, so we use this reverse features when we apply the domain classifier, and we use the regular features when we apply the class classifier. So we get a, here a prediction with 10 different classes log softmax, and here we get uh, two different classes log softmax, okay? Hope it's clear. Yeah. So, can you repeat again what the difference uh, in the graph you said that as a classifier What's the difference in back propagation? You meant yeah, exactly the last slide. You mean here? Uh, next thing, yeah. You said there's a difference uh, between the uh, domain and the class. Yeah, okay. So the idea, the difference is because we want to. We call, we call the domain loss a loss, but it's actually a, a, a confusion loss, so we want to maximize it. We want to make our model confused about what domain the data is coming from. If our model will be confused about the domain and still be able to classify to correctly what digit it is, then we can assume that it's not using any information from the domain. It's not encoding information about the domain. So all we, all we, have, all we were doing in this, in this specific... What they did in this specific paper was to reverse the gradient after you, you compute this loss and you go back, before you backprop into the, the convolutional part, you reverse the gradient, so then you apply, when you apply the gradient to the weights, when you do the regular stochastic gradient set weight update, you'll, instead of uh, going to in the negative gradient direction, you'll go in the positive gradient direction, which will cause you to actually maximize for the loss instead of minimize for the loss, but only in this part, only in the green part. All right, so we were here. Okay, but a quick question here is, if you saw, we, we took our uh, lambda here in the, forward, in the forward function as a parameter, but actually, why would we do that? So wh why, why, why change it during training? Any idea? Okay, yeah. Maybe you want uh, after a while we can assume that we have a heavy polarity it is enough. For now on we're going to need to uh, focus more on the labels. So so you're saying that lambda should uh, decrease over time. I'm saying that like we can say that for a certain point uh, one of them is uh, less important than the other. Okay, and you're saying that it should increase over time. Yeah, basically. Well, Okay, so, so basically, yeah, it should, it should actually increase because if you think about it, in the beginning, the convolutional, the convolutional features are, are basically doing nothing. They don't know anything, so they're not extracting anything, and then we can't, we can't actually do any prediction based on them. So we need to get to, to a point where our convolutional features are, are good enough before we start trying to confuse them. So the idea is really to... In the beginning, at least, ignore the domain loss because it will be very noisy because it's based on bad convolutional features. So we, we, we kind of ignore it and we, we, make, we gradually increase the lambda value. The way they did it in the paper is just with uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, formula which where they put, uh, instead of p, they, where p, p is the progress uh, in training when they normalize it to 0 and 1. So you can see it really goes to 1. All right, so good. Let's see if our model works. 
yeah, so we have, um, you can see this is our source domain, it's MNIST, so we have one channel and our target domain has three channels. And uh, passing, passing our, um, pass, passing a, a, a tensor of, uh, a batch of a batch of images to our model gives us not one but two outputs. So the first output here is our, if you recall, class predictions. So we have uh, a batch of 10 numbers each. And the other one is the domain prediction. So this could have been a logistic. It could be just one number. But, but for, for consistency, I also implemented like this. So it's just the log probability of each class instead of 1 minus. You can do whatever. And now the training. Um, this time I will show uh, an implementation of the training just because there are just a bit, a few nuances here to, to look at. So, all right. First, first of all, we this time we have two loss functions. Th this in this case they're the same, but generally, you you, you will see cases where you have ca these kind of multiple multiple heads over your model, and you might need to use actually different losses. This case, both in this case, both times we use the log softmax, and then we, so that we will apply a negative log likelihood to that, just so we have our regular classification setting. Um, and we'll train. We have a different uh, data set sizes, but we'll just, for simplicity, train. We'll, we'll define the same batch size, and we'll just train until one of them runs out, basically. So that's what I did here. All right, so let's go over the actual training really quick. Um, now I need to go over both both my data loaders, okay? So I'm going over them as iterators. You'll see that in a second. And I'm just running up till a fixed number of batches. First of all, I have to zero my gradients. And this, this, this part is calculating the lambda for this batch. So it's calculating the, the P, which is the progress in training. It, uh, it takes into account the number of batches, the number of epochs, because we're trying to, in the last batch of the last epoch, get to 1. Okay, so we're kind of, we're kind of uh, going from 0 to 1 over all the batches in all the epochs. And using the formula that I showed you to calculate the lambda. Okay, so first part, training on the source domain. We'll take uh, the next batch from our source domain iterator. We have a batch of images and a batch of labels. And we will create a domain label, or a batch of domain label. Okay, so we have a batch, batch. so we'll put a batch size here of zeros. Okay, so these are our domain labels. So, so just for every image in this batch, we, we, class, we want it to be classified as domain zero. Then we, we just pass it through a model. Remember passing this lambda. Remember our model outputs two different predictions. It outputs the prediction from the classifier head and prediction from the domain, domain head. So we get these two predictions. We calculate the loss for the, for the class prediction using the labels that we got from our data set. And for the domain, using the labels that we generated. Just zeros. Okay, we want it to be zeros. So we get these two losses in the source for the labels and in the source for the domain. Okay, then we train, train on the target. So we get our next batch of data from our target domain iterator, but this time we ignore the class labels because we're trying to say that we're doing unsupervised domain adaptation. So we're just not looking at the class labels. Okay, and we are creating domain labels, just ones, batch size. Okay, batch size ones, these are our domain labels. And again, we're gonna pass the target uh, data, target domain data through our model, get a prediction for the domain. We're ignoring the prediction for the digits themselves. We don't care about this. We don't have labels for that anyway. And just computing the domain loss here using our uh, calculated uh, one labels. Okay, and finally, the combined loss is just the sum of these losses. In, in many cases, they apply some kind of weight here. Maybe they give one of the losses more weight than others or something like that. I didn't. Uh, not sure if they did it in the paper. And then, after you have this sum of losses, you can just backward. And magically, this will backprop through both of the heads and through the gradient reversal layer, flipping the gradient and then backpropping through the convolutional part to maximize the domain loss. 
Okay, because we built build the model that way, all we have to do is just, as usual, backward. Okay, and finally, step to update the parameters. Okay, not sure if there's something to see when I run it. Yeah, okay, so I'm just running it for a few epochs, just to sh show it works. <coughs> not really going to train. But at least... At least it seems like the loss is decreasing. Okay, so we'll we'll stop here with the training and just uh, finally show a show a result from the paper. So one one of the nice things about these kind of uh, tasks is that it's it's possible to visualize the embedding of the convolutional features, which means basically if you have a tensor of the convolutional features created by your model, you can uh, visualize them by finding a way to map them onto a two D to this space, and then showing where where the where features for different classes lie. So here's an example. Just remember that the point of this confusion loss was to make the images from both domains look similar, same for the classifier. So we want our convolutional features to be the same for both domains. Okay, that's the idea. So using kind of a feature space visualization, we can we can check if that that's the case. So this is from the paper that they used. So this is a, called a, a TSNE embedding. It's not. I'm not going to explain it now. But what you what you see here is that the blue the blue uh, data is uh, an embedding of the convolutional features from MNIST onto onto a 2D plane. We have th these kind of uh, loosely connected um, clusters, probably corresponding to different digits, and the uh, in the non-adapted version, we, we get a completely different representation for the MNIST M data from the other domain. But after we adapt it, we get mu something much more homo homogeneous, which, which means that the features, the convolutional features created for both domains are much more, are much more similar compared to the non-adapted version. So this might explain why this model can actually work now for, for this target domain. Sorry? I don't remember, actually. I think uh, I linked to the paper here so you can check, check it out, but I don't remember what the accuracy numbers were. But I remember it was much higher than, of course, the original, the, the starting point. So it was, it was a really good result. And they showed it for other transfer, uh, other transfer applications, not just MNIST. So it was a really, really cool paper with cool results. So hope that was useful and see you next time.